Welcome to part one of fluid and electrolyte balance. These are our objectives for fluid and electrolytes. We're going to um, be able to state the normal structure and function to maintain fluid and electrolyte balance. The student will be able to verbalize the pathophysiological concepts related to fluids balances, edema, and electrolyte imbalances. And the student will be able to plan the care using the nursing process for clients with selected fluid and electrolyte disorders. The human body is 50 to 60 percent water, with some variations for age, body fat composition, and biological sex. A healthy adult will have 50 to 60 percent total body weight in fluid. An infant has considerably more body fluid than an elderly adult, 70 to 80 percent compared to 45 to 55 percent for an elderly adult. There's also a difference in fluid depending on the biological sex and the amount of fat cells um, in the body that can affect our body water. Biological males have less fat and more muscle, and muscle holds more water than fat cells. Women and obese people have less body water because they have more fat cells and less muscle. Water is vital to almost every body process we have. Water transports nutrients to the cells and removes wastes from those cells. Water also transport hormones, enzymes, platelets, and red and white blood cells all over the body. Water helps facilitate cellular metabolism and allows for proper cellular chemical functioning. Water helps maintain body temperature and helps facilitate digestion and elimination. Water also helps act as a tissue lubricant. Because water is so important for so many body functions, the body can only survive a few days without water. Understanding fluid balances in the body will help you care for almost every single patient you're assigned to. The fluid in our body is stored in two compartments, the intracellular and the extracellular compartments. Intracellular is the fluid found within the cells. Intracellular fluid accounts for 70% of all the fluid in our body. This fluid in the cells is crucial for cellular function. It maintains the size of the cell in its nice normal size it should be, but any changes in intracellular fluid can make the cells swell and burst or shrivel and die. Extracellular fluid is all the fluid outside of our cells and accounts for the other 30% of fluid. Extracellular fluid can be broken down into three areas, intravascular fluid or the fluid within our blood vessels, and interstitial fluid, which is all of the fluid that surrounds the tissue cells and in our lymphatic system. Changes in extracellular fluid can alter our blood pressure, can increase or decrease it. It can cause swelling or edema. The third area is our transcellular fluid, like our cerebrospinal fluid, our pericardial fluid, our pleural fluid, and our intraocular fluids. In a normal healthy person, the fluids in all of these areas will be balanced, and we call this balance homeostasis. I've already mentioned that water affects every aspect of our body. Well, we also have many body systems that are related to balancing the amount of fluid we have in our body. First, we have the kidneys. The kidneys function to eliminate or absorb water as needed by the body. The kidneys also excrete electrolytes that are in excess in our body. The cardiovascular system pumps and carries nutrients and water in our body. Cardiovascular system has baroreceptors that sense the stretch on the arteries near the heart to determine if the blood pressure is high enough, and if it's not, the baroreceptors will tell the body to retain fluid to increase the blood pressure. Our lungs remove about 300 mLs of fluid a day by our breath, which we consider insensible loss. The adrenal glands regulate blood volume and sodium and potassium balance. The pituitary gland stores and releases our antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, and that tells our body to retain water. It also helps with sodium regulation. The thyroid gland increases the blood flow in the body and increases renal circulation, which increases the amount of fluid excreted by the kidneys. The thyroid glands regulate the level of calcium in the extracellular fluid and the nervous system inhibits and stimulates mechanisms influencing our fluid balance by using osmoreceptors that sense changes to the concentration of our extracellular fluid. The nervous system also triggers our thirst sensation. 
The GI tract absorbs water and nutrients that enter the body. And the GI tract also eliminates or excretes excess fluid through our stool, although it's not as effective as our kidneys. And our skin allows for fluid loss through perspiration, which is another type of insensible water loss. Now our body is pretty smart and it's always in a constant state of fluid gains or fluid losses. We gain fluid by what we eat and by what we drink and a small amount um, as a byproduct of metabolism. Our thirst center is regulated by our hypothalamus and it controls how thirsty we feel depending on how the serum osmolality changes. Increases in serum osmolality will cause us to get thirsty. We lose water every day through our kidneys producing urine, about one LML per kilo per hour. We lose it through insensible losses like our lungs and our skin and a small amount through our stool. Typically, our daily intake and output numbers are equal. We lose everything we take in. This is called fluid balance or homeostasis. As long as our body is working as it should, we will maintain this constant state of fluid balance or homeostasis all day long. When we discuss fluids and electrolytes in the body, we need to discuss the mechanisms that help fluid and electrolytes move within the body. First, we have the concept of solvents and solutes. Solvents are the liquids that hold a substance in a solution. In the body, the solvent is water. Solutes are the substances that are dissolved into the solution. In the body, this is our electrolytes and our non-electrolytes. The body will balance fluid and electrolytes by moving fluids and electrolytes between the intracellular and extracellular fluid spaces to keep the balance in proportions they need to be in for op optimal functioning. The fluids and electrolytes always have to be in perfect balance to maintain homeostasis, so the body is constantly moving fluids and electrolytes around. The first way the body allows for movement is by osmosis. Osmosis is when water passes from an area of lesser solute concentration to a greater concentration until they meet an equilibrium or they equalize themselves out. The second way the body allows for movement is diffusion. Diffusion is the tendency of solutes to move freely throughout a solvent. The solutes will move from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration until equilibrium is achieved. Electrolytes can move by active transport, which is a process that requires energy to move substances through a cell membrane against a concentration gradient, like going from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. The sodium potassium pump is a great example of active transport. Lastly, we have capillary filtration. Capillary filtration allows the passage of fluid through a permeable membrane from an area of higher hydrostatic pressure to lower hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure is the pressure exerted on the walls of the blood vessels. Capillary filtration is also dependent on osmotic pressure, which is the pressure exerted by the protein in plasma. This is not the first time we've discussed how important protein is. We discussed it with nutrition, we discussed it with skin and wounds, and now we're discussing it again with fluid and electrolytes. Here's a picture showing you the principles of osmosis and diffusion. The top pictures are showing you osmosis. On the top left side of the picture, we have an area of low fluid and high solutes compared to the right side where there's high fluid and low solutes. If you look at the top right picture, the fluid has balanced out, so the ratio of fluid to solutes is more balanced for the amount of solutes. The bottom picture shows diffusion. The bottom left-hand picture shows um, a lot more solutes on the left side as compared to the right, so the solutes move from the, higher, the area of higher concentration to the area of lower concentration to balance out the amount of solutes. This balance is shown in the picture on the bottom right-hand side. Let's go back to solutions and osmosis for a second. Solutions are solvent and solutes. The concentration of solutes dissolved in a volume of solution is called the osmolarity. The concentration of solutes dissolved in a weight of solution is called osmolality. We discuss osmolarity as tonicity as it relates to the osmolality of plasma. 
A solution that has the same osmolality as plasma is considered an isotonic solution. Isotonic fluid remains in the intravascular compartment and will not flow across any semi-permeable membrane. Hypertonic solutions have greater osmolality than plasma, causing the water to move out of the cells and into the intravascular compartment. This will cause the cells to shrink. Hypotonic solutions have less osmolality than plasma, which causes fluid to leave the intravascular space and go into the cells, causing the cells to swell. In block one, you do not need to know about the different types of fluids, just understand the concepts of fluid movement. The last topic that's related to fluid and electrolytes is electrolytes. Electrolytes are the negatively or positively charged chemicals found in our body. Positively charged electrolytes are called cations. The major cations in the body are sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. Please note that potassium is the elemental symbol K, and potassium is not the same thing as vitamin K. Negatively charged electrolytes are called anions, and the major anions in the body are chloride, bicarbonate, and phosphate. When we look at our lab values, all electrolytes are measured and resulted in milliequivalents per liter or milligrams per deciliter. It's also important to know that concentrations of these electrolytes are not the same intracellularly and extracellularly. We're gonna talk more about electrolytes in depth in parts three and part four of this lecture. And this is the end of part one of fluid and electrolytes.